There was this man whose name was Frederick Nietzsche. He was a man who was very influential and he was an atheist guy, a guy who didn't believe in God. He was in the 18th century. He wrote a book called The Gay Science, which was very popular. In that book, he wrote these words, God is dead, God remains dead, and we have killed him. These are the words that Friedrich Nietzsche has written in a book. And apparently, these words mark the beginning of secular atheism. That's where the godlessness began to creep in through all the world and uh, to every nation, every, every tribe. This is how it entered. But Frederick Nietzsche, January 3rd, 1889, he suffered a mental breakdown. Apparently he saw a horse, he whipped it, he ran to the animal, threw his arms around the animal and then collapsed on the ground. And from there his health began a downhill journey and he was in an asylum. And uh, in late August 1900 he suffered and died from a th third and final stroke. My friends, many people have tried throughout the history to smother the message of God. They tried again and again and atheists basically try to de define life without having God in the equation. I don't know how that's going to work. It's never going to work to ex explain life without having God. And they try to explain morality, but how can a person explain morality without the application of God himself, without God putting God in the equation? And present day we see and hear many philosophies in this world that try to tackle human problems. But my Bible, the word of God that we believe in, gives one word that separates man, that causes man to struggle in his life, and then one word is called sin. It's through Adam and Eve, through their rebellion against God, that sin entered mankind. Sin separated that fellowship between God and man, but God, in his marvelous grace and mercy, try to restore this intimacy that was lost because of sin. The first thing he did was to give a direction for sacrifices where men sacrificed animals and shed their blood to restore the relationship with God on a temporary basis. The sacrifices, why, why, why is there a need for sacrifice? Bible says without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. So the problem could be dealt with in only one way, by sacri sacrificing animals. And during the course of time, we saw it in, this, in the beginning of the series, every person, every parent in a family acted as a mediator between God and man. In Egypt, a father, you know, when he sacrificed an animal, they applied blood on the doorpost, and every family defended for itself, or uh, the unit as a family was protected by the father who was acting like a priest for in, uh, in behalf of God and man. So as time went on, people didn't have a place to meet with God, to worship him, and to uh, experience his presence. So God gave something wonderful. He wanted, right from the beginning of history, God longs for fellowship, and it hasn't changed even till today. And God said, okay, build me a place, a dwelling place called the tabernacle. This tabernacle, the Bible talks about this place for 50 chapters, 5-0. Extreme detail is given to explain this place called Tabernacle and God appointed a certain man called the high priest who was acting as a mediator in between the people and himself. The high priest was, the, was bridging the gap between a nation of Israel and God himself in order to restore fellowship. In part two of this high priest series, I talked about the shadow on the substance. I said, where there's a shadow, there's a proof that there is a substance. You know, when you can look at a shadow and derive, in essence, what the object is. So there's a shadow and a substance principle that exists all throughout the scripture. You with me so far? Boring? No, thank you. I know there's 72 more than God gave us, gave us more than 72 hours of long weekend. You're spending only an hour and a half in the church, so that's good. Right? So that's okay. Shadow and a substance. Old Testament is like a shadow. New Testament is like the substance. And we also see how the small and imperfect Old Testament becomes the perfect and the great uh, that God has revealed to mankind. We also see how the natural leads to the spiritual. God uses the natural phenomena and from the natural phenomena he explains the spiritual concepts. 
And we also see how a nation represents an individual. A nation of Israel uh, in the Old Testament represents a believer in the New Testament. So there's a pattern that is established constantly in the high priest that was acting like a being mediator between man and God represented Jesus Christ himself. So not only the high priest, every detail that God gave in the Old Testament, the tabernacle, the feast, the sacrifices, the garments of this high priest and the services that are meant to be offered to God, everything points to Jesus Christ. That's why we uh, see this, uh, I mean, the, the marvelous thing is even the clothes that the person wears pointed to Christ. That's why Christ makes a bold claim in John 5, 39. He says, you search the scripture, for in them you think you have eternal life, uh, and these are they which testify of me. Christ is making a bold claim, and he said, all scriptures were written about him. So you mean the garments of the high priest talk about Christ? Yes, they do. Every little detail in the scriptures, it talks about Christ. Believe it or not, Bible is the only book in history that asks itself to be tested. Christ makes a claim, you, you search the scriptures. He gives an open invitation to search the scriptures to know the truth. Quran, a Muslim Islam religious book, never allows anybody to scrutinize its scriptures. If they want to question Quran, they'll be put to death. Can you imagine the difference? God gave us so much liberty and said, search the scriptures and they talk about me. And also, Bible says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So you are sitting here this morning, it's like, why do I care to know about the garments of a high priest? How is that going to affect me and how is that going to apply in my life? Let me tell you, Bible says that all scripture from Genesis to Revelation is meant for our edification so that we'll be equipped for every good work. So we're going to understand these concepts and we're going to derive some amazing principles just from the garments of a high priest. So we started the first time I, when I preached on this, uh, uh, the series of the high priest. God appointed and delegated and appointed special people for the construction of the tabernacle, for designing of these clothes, and, and, and the Bible says they were filled with God's spirit. They're filled with wisdom, understanding, and knowledge, and they worked with their hands, and they, they designed various pieces of furniture. But believe it or not, nothing of this creation, nothing of this furniture or tabernacle is left to human ingenuity. What I mean to say is, God didn't leave any room for people to think and create stuff on their own whims and fancies. When God wants us to do something, when God wants us to do his work, it has to be done his way. There's no way around it. So when God gave the details, you will see while well, we go through this, he gave every little detail as to what needs to be done. But even then, even when you're working in God's work, you need the help of the Holy Spirit to accomplish the task. And God did this with his craftsmen. And these craftsmen were also responsible to design and construct the garments of a high priest. There were so many details that were given, and the high priest garments are called the golden garments. There are eight pieces of these garments. Last time I wore these garments, but uh, I'm be, I'll be wearing it next week and the following week, because today I have to do the communion, so I have to walk around, so it's really hard to walk in the high priest garments. So bear with me, just let's follow the pictures. These are the garments, these eight pieces of golden, uh, of golden garments are what these people have designed. So why were these garments designed? I talked about it last time. Bible says this is in Exodus chapter 28, 2 and 3. And you shall make these holy garments for Aaron, your brother, who was the first high priest, for glory and for beauty, so that you can speak to uh, all the gifted artisans whom I am filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make, the, make Aaron's, Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest. There are three reasons why God gave specifications as to how these garments need to be made. Number one, for a identification. When the priest wore these garments and he walked around, the people were able to recognize that this man is a mediator between God and himself. 
So his identity was seen in the garments that were designed. Number two, for consecration. This garment set this man apart. For example, I'll give you a simple example. If a guy wearing normal civilian clothes uh, tries to stop you while you're driving on the road, you really don't care. You just keep driving or it's like okay, somebody is waving off. But if that guy wears a police costume, has a badge, has a hat, and you know, has a little stick in his hand, and he just does that, all of a sudden, you who are driving at 120 um, kilometers per hour, you'll come to a sudden stop or you try to slow down immediately. Why? It's because you're not afraid of the same guy He's just a human and he can do nothing, but you are respecting the costume the person is wearing. And that makes you slow down. Some in India, they don't, right? You see the cop, you turn around and keep going because you don't carry license and stuff, and then it's like playing a video game with the cops. They try to catch you in those streets, and I did that too. I'm a sinner. All right, thank you. Right. But that's how the cops do it. And that's why they try to get a hold of the person because their costume that they're wearing gives them the authority. A lawyer, when he wears a costume, gives him his ability. And a priest, when he wears this costume, it separates him and sets him apart for the task that was assigned for him. And the third thing is for ordination, which means these clothes are meant to minister to people. Talk about fashion wear. How are these clothes Ministering to people. That's what we are going to try to crack the code this morning. I like to use this to crack the code. I like to be like an investigator. Don't you? Let's crack the code of this costume. Let's go ahead here. What are the materials that they used? They beat gold into thin, thin sheets and cut them into threads. They work blue, purple, scarlet thread into fine linen into artistic design. So the materials were five different kinds. They were gold, blue wool, scarlet wool, purple wool, and finally, twisted linen. There are a few things that are very important before we go ahead. This costume had wool in it. This costume had linen in it. But God says, when you enter the tabernacle into the sanctuary, the priest is only supposed to wear linen garments. But when he's facing the nation, he's wearing all those eight pieces of it. They're called the golden garments. Why did he separate the two at the attire into two categories. The linen is inside, so the outward layer is shut off uh, when he entered into the presence of God. So with a little bit of work, try to find, uh, I try to find the difference between wool and linen. This is what it is. Ezekiel, this is what the reason the Bible says the high priest is not supposed to wear woolen garments when he approaches God himself. It says this, when they enter the gates of the inner court, they are to wear linen clothes. They must not wear any woolen garment while ministering in the gates of the inner court or inside the temple. They are to wear linen turbans on their heads, linen undergarments around the waist. They must not wear anything that makes them perspire, which means sweat. There are only three places the word sweat is used in the Bible. Number one in Genesis Number two is right here. Number three, Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll come to that in a little bit. So what's the difference between the wool and the linen? Number one, wool represents the exterior and symbolizes the world. The linen garment symbolizes a person's heart. So number two, linen, uh, wool produces sweat. Believe it or not, I never knew that something called woolen garments existed to keep a person warm until three or four years after I came to Canada. I went on a tour with the band. I had a sleeping bag, and apparently it has temperature uh, specifications for it. I didn't know that. And it was like a seven degree sleeping bag. I never knew that. So I thought sleeping bag is warm, that itself will do it. But mind you, my friends, I was in a place called Winnipeg. <laughs> Minus 32, I was sleeping in an RV with this seven degree sleeping bag. I had probably six layers of clothing, and at four o'clock I was shivering like anything, and I said, Lord, if this is persecution, I'm facing it. It was so torturous. Then after I came back from a whole tour across Canada, somebody told me that there are woolen clothes that keep people warm. I went to Bridgewater into that used clothing store, and I bought myself a woolen jacket. 
when I first put it on, I was so angry as to why people didn't tell me that there is something like this that will keep you warm, that something like this exists. Even my own wife didn't tell me about it. <laughs> so my friends, one thing I know, that if you wear woolen clothes, you will sweat. Even in winter, so I like that concept. Even when I shovel, I put on the woolen clothes now. If in, during winter time, if you see me with only one piece of clothing and one jacket, that's it, it's all woolen. Right? I'm trying to buy woolen socks, everything woolen in my house right now. <laughs> right? So wool produces sweat. But what does that symbolize? Sweat is a result of the curse, the fall of man. Sweat didn't, didn't exist before sin entered mankind. But God, when man fell into sin, sweat is a, is a consequence of sin. So God expects when a person enters his presence, the curse of sin is undone in his presence. No longer you'll be sweat, sweating wearing, wearing the linen garments. Isn't that fascinating? Let's move on. Wool comes from sheep. Linen comes from a seed called flax. The uh, Latin name, linen, eustatisium, or something like that. It's a big name. Sorry, I don't want to mention that. But this is the seed that is used to produce this cloth. Wool doesn't require labor or time. Just shear it. You got it. But in order to produce linen garments, you got to seek the so uh, soak the seeds for months. Then you have to dry them from, for years. Then you have to comb them with special combs to have long, soft flax fibers. And then they're woven, woven into fabric. Only the rich could afford linen garments during the time of Christ. So let's move on. So it's a natural covering for the sheep, but it's a supernatural covering for the priest. If you look at the sheep, they're always downward focused. So the natural worldly covering is all earthly. But when the priest, if you look at the seeds of linen, they all point straight. When the seeds are planted close together, it seems, they grow straight into the sky. This wool has spots, blemishes, and speckles on it. Linen is pure, no spots, no blemishes, no stripes. It's worn in the field, represents the world. It's worn in the sanctuary, in the presence of God. Linen is worn in the sanctuary. Wool doesn't require death. You don't kill the sheep to get the wool. You just shear it. But in order to produce linen, you got to kill the plant to produce the seed. So in order to be in the presence of God, you need absolute death. But the wool, you don't need. So what is this mystery? Why did I get into this wool and linen stuff? Because there's one scripture that integrates wool and linen together in a beautiful way. In Revelation 19, 7, 8, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb. The lamb that is blemishless, it is Christ himself. Uh, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. The merger of wool and linen happens in the book of Revelation. And the high priest in his garments, you see this wool that is integrated with linen itself, which is like a foundational fabric. It represents the ultimate destiny for every believer. Is it marvelous? Okay, let's move on. Or maybe I'm the only guy excited here. Okay, let's move on here. The different colors that are used in these fabrics. Gold represents deity of Christ. Linen, the righteousness. Blue represents the heavenly origin. Purple, the royalty. Scarlet, the suffering of Christ Jesus, which we talked about a lot of times, so I just want to mention that again. So let's get into details of the different components of these garments. Exodus 28.4, thanks Leah for using those words and which are very complicated, but still did, she did a good job, isn't it? Reading that passage. Thank you, right? I was just testing your English. Usually I speak better English, right? But thanks Leah, you did it anyway. Okay, Exodus 28.4, and these are the garments they shall make, a breastplate, a ephod, a robe, a, a skillfully woven tunic, turban, sash, and these are the garments that God expects to design. Let's start off with the linen. Weave the tunic of fine linen and make a turban of fine linen. Make the linen undergarments covering for the body, reaching up to the waist, to the thigh. Linen is the foundational fabric for the whole garment here. And it represents the righteousness of God, the sinlessness. White is sinlessness. Just remember that. 
And then we move on. There's a robe which God wanted them to design and it is blue in color. And blue represents heavenliness. He said the robe of ephod, entirely blue cloth with an opening for the head in its center, there shall be a woven edge like a collar around this opening so that it will not tear. You know what I like about this passage? How God is so detailed in everything that he says. He says, uh, have an opening that it will not tear. He was giving the specific instructions as to how it should be made. He's not, he's not, not left anything for this craftsman to think about. Every detail is given. So the blue represents the heaven, heavenliness and the hope that a believer has. And then there are these bells and pomegranates. Did I say that right? Pomegranates? I didn't practice that. Pomegranates? Pomegranates? Hey, I know better English. I said that before. Pomegranates. Whatever it is, you understand, right? In India, if you need to go anywhere, all you got to do is speak few words of English and they'll understand. You don't need to have construction of sentences. It's like you go there and say, me, bus stop, where? And that guy will say, okay, right there. You don't need to have a sentence. You need a bus stop to go on a bus. You don't need sentences. That's what I'm trying to do here, right? Pomegranates, whatever you understand, that's what matters, right? So bells, pomegranates are sewn at the bottom of this robe. The Bible says it's make pomegranates of blue, purple, scarlet yarn around the hem of the robe with golden bells between them. The golden bells and the pomegranates are alternate, uh, uh, alternate around the hem of the robe. Aaron must wear it when he ministers. The sound of the bells uh, will be heard when he enters the holy place before the Lord and when he comes out so that he will not die. With so many strict regulations here. There are 72 alternative bells and pomegranates that are stitched into the hem of the garment. And every time a priest entered the holy place, they could hear the sound, and that sound indicates that the priest is alive. And also says that he is working. So what are these bells and pomegranates significant for? The pomegranates signify the fruit in a believer's life. Bible says in Matthew 7, 16, by their fruit you shall know. It's not by their fruits, mind you. It's by their fruit you shall know. A believer produces the fruit of the Holy Spirit. If you are a Christian, there are few things that the Bible says that are seen in you. The fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. If you have the love, if you have the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, you are actually bearing the fruit of a Christian life. So that's what this pomegranate is significant for. So when you buy a pomegranate, you open it. There are many seeds, but there's only one fruit. Different characters all in one. It also symbolizes a believer, that's you and me, how we all are knit together in one being of Christ himself. Different compartments, but still one unit. That's what it's significant for. So what about those bells? The bells are responsible so that the world might know that you are in the sanctuary. When the bells are ringing, the world knows that you're in the sanctuary. Number two, it reminds you that you need to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The fruit and the bells go together. Here is your fruit, which is the faith that you believe in, the qualities of a believer, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, and all these characters. But the bell keeps ringing to remind you that this should be your lifestyle. But how will you know um, when you're actually producing the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The only way you know that you're bearing the fruit is when you're moving. When will you hear the ringing of the bell? Only when you move. Is it complicated or am I getting it? So what happens is as a believer, when you walk and work in the Lord's work doing His will, the bells will be ringing and your life will be testifying, but you will be reminding yourself these are the qualities you need to have in the presence of God in this world that you live in. 
Many people have a problem with faith and works. Do we get saved by faith? Do we get saved by works? We are saved through faith by grace, period. But we have something called the faith that works. It's not faith and works. It's a faith that works. If you are a Christian, you will bear fruit. If you are a Christian, you will be serving the Lord, period. You cannot separate this both. Oh, I'm a Christian and I want to be selfish. No, it doesn't work that way. You are meant to pour out your life for others. You are meant to serve God, obeying his commandments, bearing the fruit in your life. That's what a Christian is. Let's move on. Ephod. It's a strange kind of thing here. It's a garment which is blue, gold, blue, purple, scar- scarlet, finely twisted, and this, is, this goes around the linen garments. What does this ephod represent? The Old Testament, there's a language and a word used called the coat of many colors. Have you heard that before? Who wears that? It's okay, I won't eat people. Joseph, thank you. You can speak. You had your breakfast. I knew that. Anyway, Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ. Nowhere in the New Testament you will see uh, any apostle mention that Joseph is a type of Christ. But if you look at the life of Jesus, it's an exact replica or a pattern of Jesus himself. Joseph had a coat of many colors. Jesus, as a priest, had this coat of many colors in a way. It's a symbolism that I'm talking about, not literally. So Joseph, one day, he was sent by the father to his brothers... And what happened? His brothers threw him in a pit, which is symbolic of how the Father in heaven has sent Jesus Christ to his own brothers, which is the Jewish people, but how they rejected him, and Joseph was thrown in a pit. Christ was dead and buried. And after that, the brothers sold him, and the brothers sold Joseph to the Gentiles, to the slave traders from Egypt. And in Egypt, Pharaoh, uh, Joseph prospers and he becomes the governor. See the pattern here? What happens? Because of the Jewish people's rejection of Christ, the Gentiles got Christ and he's the king for the Jews. See the pattern here? So the coat of many, many colors, the pattern that is established, and the ephod symbolizes the work and the call of every believer and the call of Christ himself. And in this ephod, the two onyx stones that are placed on the shoulders. This is what the Bible says. Take two onyx stones, engrave on them the names of the uh, sons of Israel by the order of birth, six names on each stone, uh, remaining six on the other. So they had to carve the names of all the tribes, and these names of the tribes were placed upon the shoulders. What does that represent? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, and a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. When Christ or the priest entered the sanctuary of God, he was carrying the names of the nation of Israel into the presence of God. And Christ took the garment of the people, of the people who are lost, he took them upon the shoulders in order to enter the sanctuary. And this is a remarkable scripture actually. For unto us a child is born, son is given. Here is a simple logic. A son is never born, a child is never given. Let me explain. Child is born talks about the humanity of Christ. He became flesh to dwell among us. But son was pre-existent before the creation of the world. That's why he was given, not born. See the mystery? God is very accurate with his words. He's not going to beat around the bush. Such a beautiful scripture. And the government was placed upon his shoulders. Moving on, the crown. I'm not going to cover all the components, but I'm going to cover only a few things. And this, we're coming to the conclusion almost. The crown of holiness. He says, make a plate of pure gold, engrave on, it, uh, uh, on a seal, holy to the Lord. Fasten blue cord to it, attach it to the turban. It is to be in the front of the turban. It will be on Aaron's forehead. And he will bear the guilt Involved in the sacred gifts of the Israelites, cons- uh, Israelites consecrate, whatever the gifts may be, it will be on Aaron's forehead continually so that they will be acceptable unto the Lord. So the priest, when he wears the turban, and, and it's this little golden plate which says, holy unto the Lord, when people look at it, 
It's they're placing all their sin upon this one man who's a mediator, who's taking up and bearing the guilt of the whole world. My friends, simple thing. When we look at the face of Jesus Christ, what are we looking for? Are we looking for gifts? Are we looking for blessings? Are we looking for a good lotto ticket or something? What are you looking to Christ's face for? The first thing we need to remember is when we look into the face of Christ, he took my guilt, my shame upon himself as a mediator. That's what it should remind us of. That's what the scripture is talking about. So when we are going through this world, depressed, ridiculed, and the feelings and emotions are so low and you're feeling uh, abandoned, you feel abandoned by God, all you got to do is look to the face of Jesus Christ because he took the sin upon himself, period, and is done with. That is our hope, my friend. That's where we need to put our trust. In this world, we will have many troubles. In this world, I will fail and sin until I get my perfect body. We will fail. We are imperfect beings. But my hope comes from this one mediator, one man who took all my guilt upon himself. That's what we need to look in the face of Jesus Christ. Moving on. There's a belt that held everything together. God says make a belt so they will not stumble. So in order to have this costume, you need the belt because you're working around, you don't want to stumble. And Ephesians use the word, the belt of truth. We need to tie ourselves with this truth when we work in the service of the Lord. First Peter 1.13 says, Gird up the lines of, your, lines of your mind to be sober and hope in his end for the grace that is to be brought unto you through the revelation of Jesus Christ. We need to gird up the lines of our mind, the belt of truth so that we can understand the grace that is there in the revelation of Christ. Coming to the conclusion here. Everything that you see in this tabernacle and these components point to Jesus Christ in the scripture. Not only would you see the priest's garments pointing to Christ, but Christ has actually made you something and he calls you a royal priesthood and a holy nation. First Peter 2.9 says, but you are chosen a royal priesthood and a holy nation. So wait a minute. So Christ was the high priest, but because of his sacrifice, because of his, his death on the cross, and because of what he has done to his death, burial, and resurrection, he made me a priest. And we are the kingdom of priests. So what does he expect from us? He expects, we saw those three things, consecration, identification, and ordination. We as believers, we see, and I preached that last time, we need to be separate in this world. We need to be identified as Christians. And number three, we need to minister for God's works and God's purposes in our life. So tying all these three things together, let's look at these aspects and components before I conclude. The component, the linen garment, signifies the sinlessness of Christ, but talks about our righteousness, which is imputed because of Christ's sinlessness. Robe talks about heavenliness, and talks about the hope for us as believers. Bells and pomegranates talks about the law and fulfillment in Christ. Christ fulfilled the law, and he bare the fruit so that we can prosper, and talks about the faith and the works of a believer. Ephod talks about the call in Christ's life. I compare it with Joseph's life and talks about our responsibility and our call towards one another. The crown talks about the holiness of God and talks about our putting our trust in that holiness of God in Christ taking upon the guilt upon himself. The belt talks about the truth and the truthfulness that he expects from our life. So the garments are made for glory and beauty. In order to make a costume like that, it would cost an arm and a leg probably. This gold weaving, uh, woven into, the, into every thread and every fabric. What a beautiful garment it must have been. For glory and beauty, for consecration. Christ was a sinless lamb who was set apart from heaven. He fulfilled the law and he fulfilled uh, the sacrifice that is ultimate sacrifice that is required. He fulfilled his call. He lived a holy life. He lived in truth. And he was, he is the truth. 
And for us, this is what God expects from us if you are expected to serve in his presence. We need to be involved. You put all these things together, this is what you can come up with. We need to be involved in the righteous works of the Lord with responsibility and truthfulness, putting on faith, hope, and trust in Christ alone. That's what it all sums up to. So my friends, we need to do what God wants us. But are we living a Christian life that flows or are we stagnant and say all I need is Jesus? And somebody said, I have to refute this statement. Somebody said you're so heavenly minded that you are no earthly good. I have to refuse that statement because if you are truly heavenly minded, you will be absolutely of earthly good. You will be used in this world. How can you keep quiet when you have experienced such a marvelous grace in Christ himself who has been showing you time and time again the mysteries that are there in the word? And after that, why do we become stagnant? God expects to love him Love one another. Do we fulfill that commandment? Do we serve with responsibility and in all truthfulness? We are the Lord's people. I conclude with, I'll conclude with this story. I read this yesterday. I don't know why I'm telling you this story. It's out of place, but I think it's very important. To, the call to follow Christ is not to be a good man is to be a godly man. The call to follow Christ doesn't involve riding in the clouds of hallucinations and whims and fancies. The call to follow Christ is to deny yourself and take up the cross and follow him. The path to Christ is through cross and through discipline and then only we can become a disciple. I was reading this Fox's Book of Martyrs yesterday there's a particular man of God in, I think, 1577. He was condemned because he believed and he was living a life based on the truth of the word of God. He was condemned to die. He was about to be burned alive. He, along with six others, had the same kind of punishment. But the rest of the five guys, they looked at this man of God and said, you know what, we are ready to die for Christ, but we want to know only one thing. When you are burned alive on a stake, is that really going to hurt? We don't know. We are really, really scared because um, we don't know what to expect in that fire. Of course, we all know that it hurts. So can you give us an indication when you are actually burning that God is still giving you the strength to overcome? They asked this man of God who is about to be burned alive. So this man steps up on the pyre and the flames are just devouring him and his uh, skin begins to shrivel and his uh, fingers start falling apart and, his, uh, and it doesn't give any indication yet that it is not painful. It doesn't give any indication, clue to the rest of the five friends that it's not painful. But all of a sudden, he lifts up his hand, which was the code for them, and he begins to clap his hands and rejoice and then he gives up his spirit. My friends, I read that story and I said, to what extent would I want to go with the call that God called me for? I want to ask you the same question. To what extent do you want to take God seriously? Do you want to compromise with the world and live the same lifestyle? I'm sorry. You should be either in or out. You cannot be in.